I want to talk about an early moment of fairy tale from the Sub-Zero Emperor arc that hits a little differently once you've seen the final season. During this arc, Natsu and his team are off on an S-Class request where an island of people are being turned into demons by the moon and want the moon destroyed. By the end of the arc though, we learn that that's not actually the case. What's actually been going on is that the people of the island have been made to forget who they are and believe that they are human and not demon, but they've been demons all along. And this leads to Natsu saying this. You're Definitely demons. I don't know. If you look at their faces, <laughs> my son is alive! They kind of look more like angels to me. There's a definite argument to be made that this entire arc is foreshadowing the eventual reveal that Natsu is END. The idea of all these people who believe themselves to be human, who have actually been demons all along, is essentially what happens to Natsu. But what I love most about Natsu's line here that works even before we know the end result of his arc, it's that this line is showing Natsu as someone who doesn't care who you are, what you are, he just wants to see people happy. It's such a great character moment while also being something that if you've seen the whole show you're like oh there's something interesting going on here fairy tale fans does anybody else laugh every time gray's iced shell comes up apart from maybe the first time i don't think there's ever any serious thought that maybe it could happen so intentional or not it feels like a joke and this is just made all the better by its second to last use in the Tartaros arc, where the whole setup there is him having to get over this self-sacrifice, fear of Deliora kind of situation he's been in his whole life, and theoretically not ever want to do this again. I refuse to die. My friends would get way too sappy if I did. But it happens again, to a new extreme. Because this last time, it's not just that the ice shell will also take him out. It's that it'll erase him from all of existence, so no one will ever have to miss him or anything. It is super iced shell, if you will. It erases the caster's entire existence from the world. So everyone I've met throughout my life will totally forget about me. I'm okay with that. It just means no one has to grieve. There have been way too many tears already! So I'm rewatching Fairy Tale, and I'm up to episode 229, The Art of Regression, and I noticed something weird. And I know Durmbolt slash Mest has a connection to Wendy. But what is this moment right here trying to say that connection is? I just never noticed this before and had to share it with everybody. <laughs> Here's a random fairy tale thought. Are the Exceeds to Edelis what the dragons are to Earthland? Dragons were at one point the most powerful beings in Earthland, it seems. And it is because they're so powerful, so magical, that their war is what kicked off pretty much everything that happens in the series. Over on the Edelis side of things, this is a world with little to no magic, and so the most powerful beings are presented to us as the Exceeds, these cats with wings. We even see similar degrees of fear in the humans between either of them when it seems like the creature of the respective world is coming after them. This is why when Natsu and his group show up in Edelis, everybody is shocked to see Happy and Carla seemingly being good to them. And of course, you can't forget this picture of Happy as a dragon from one episode of Fairy Tale. Making this even more interesting is how much the Exceeds are connected to the Dragon Slayers. All five of the Dragon Slayers who were actually raised by dragons end up with an Exceed that has a similar relationship to them in a way of like the dragons are to the Dragon Slayers as the Dragon Slayers are to the Exceeds. And then potentially making this even weirder is how we could connect the way the Exceeds were sent to Earthland, a land with more magic, to the way the Dragon Slayers were sent to the future where there's more magic. Anyway, I don't have a major point this time. It's just interesting parallels that I want to at least bring up. I want to talk fairy tale, and specifically the war with the dragons from Bagley 400 years ago, aka the Dragon King Festival. What we learned in the final season of the show is at least on the eastern continent of Ishgar, humans and dragons used to live in relative harmony. But then we get these rumblings of something going on in the west. I come bearing bad news. The dragons in the west show no signs of relenting. 
It's only a matter of time before they've consumed all the humans and come to Ishgar. But then closer to the end of the series, we get this. Doctor, I heard an unsettling rumor during my recent travels. There's talk of a new type of magic on the western continent, with the sole purpose of killing dragons. Now this is weird on the face of it, because we heard in that other episode that Irene is the one who created the Dragon Slayer magic, and she is in the east, in Ishgar, with the two Acnologias. Now it's completely possible that the Western Continent also created Dragon Slayer magic at about the same time. Like, if you have these huge, ferocious beasts hunting you, it makes sense to find a way to fight back. But then after the original Acnologia goes to check things out, he comes back and his personality seems to have completely changed. He goes from being the guardian of this city to destroying it. All this leads me to question, was something else behind all this? Did someone somehow influence the dragons to cause them to fight the humans in this way? Was anything going on in the West at all? This war is literally responsible for everything that happens in the series of fairy tale. If not for this, Zeref and Acnologia would have never become the villainous characters they are in the actual show, and it is through their actions that everything else from the series, even the formation of the fairy tale guild, happens. So because of all this, I can't help but be curious, what happened here? And totally unrelated, but if I were to be a dragon slayer raised by a dragon, I'd want it to be this good good boy right here, this dog dragon. I don't know what element they are, but it seems like the right choice. Let's talk fairy tale, and specifically the question, why is Urza so powerful? And this is going to be an interesting one because it's going to require some inference on our part because it's never explicitly stated, but I think there's enough of a roadmap for us to be able to explain this pretty decently. In the final season of Fairy Tale, it comes out that Urza's mother is Irene, the very first dragon slayer and the inventor of dragon slayer magic. Irene became pregnant with Urza 700 years ago because everything consequential happened 700 years ago, and she stayed pregnant for about... 680-ish years before actually giving birth to Urza. Part of this was because Irene was starting to turn into a dragon, as all the other dragon slayers have. And she feared what the baby's father was going to do the moment she gave birth and was no longer useful. And in the end, she really only does give birth to Urza because she has the idea that she could swap bodies with her daughter. But Irene having this crazy power and being the first ever dragon slayer and then giving birth to Urza over an incredibly extended time, I think it's safe to say that what's going on here is Urza has the power, the raw energy of a dragon slayer just without any of the problems like the possibility of turning into a dragon. She doesn't have that dragon seed inside of her, but she has all the power from it. In a way, she's almost like Blade from Marvel Comics, where he was born half vampire because his mother was turned while she was pregnant, and he ended up with a lot of the powers of vampires without most of their weaknesses. And while making this comparison, it's extra interesting that Blade's nickname is the Daywalker, because he's a vampire who could walk in the day. And if we go over to Edelis, Ursa's last name over there is Nightwalker. Was this purposely done as a hint? Probably not, but it's a fun coincidence and I like it. Fairy Tale Rewatch has gotten into the Taro's Arc, and I have an idea of a spin-off I would love to see. Without a doubt, Prime Sorcier has the most potential for something super cool. A group of former villains going around taking out dark guilds in order to find redemption they don't believe they'll ever truly find? Oh my god, it's so compelling! There are a lot of cool side characters, a lot of really interesting guilds, but I think this is definitely number one on my list, if there were to ever be a spin-off. And I'm not counting 100 Year Quest as a spin-off, that's a sequel, that's a slightly different thing. So let's talk about Larkade's magic in Fairy Tale, or at least talk around it because I don't think I could be super explicit here. <laughs> let's just see the scene where he explains the first massive spell he's doing. What kind of magic is this? Why did it only affect her? Too much. Just hang in there. My magic is rooted in pleasure, and all those who have tasted it cannot escape its grip. Relentless pleasure sounds like a gift, doesn't it? But too much is dangerous. For most of the episode before this point, we have been seeing people fall over in pleasure because his spell is affecting everybody who has ever felt it before. And I think there are two pretty basic ways we could interpret this. Either that his spell affects anybody who has ever spent time with a partner or anyone who has ever felt pleasure at all, even if it's by themselves. Honestly, I think the latter interpretation makes more sense just because why would magic care about how you felt it before? But it is really funny that either way, this episode is just giving canon answers to 
which characters have or haven't felt these things. Also important to note that Larkade's explanation comes after Irene has said this about her own daughter. I find it hard to believe that not a single one of you was affected by Larkade's spell. I haven't checked, but I have to assume that Larkade and his magic comes up in the fairy tale portion of AO3 a lot. Let's talk fairy tale, and today I'm talking specifically the seeds inside of Natsu and what he could become. In the Tartaros Arc of Fairy Tale, we learn that there's a dragon seed inside of all the dragon slayers, that is where they get this dragon slayer magic power. And while it gives them enough power to be able to fight dragons, it also is what turns them into dragons and is what created Echnologia. We learn in the Tartaros Arc that the five main dragon slayers of the series all have these dragon seeds inside of them, and when their dragons disappeared, it's actually that the dragons were going inside of them to prevent the seeds from ever growing. Basically, so these dragon slayers can have the power of dragon slayers without the consequences. In the final season of Fairy Tale, we learn that not only does Natsu have this dragon seed inside of him, but he has a demon seed inside of him because he's not fully Natsu Dragneel, he's a theorist Natsu Dragneel. The original Natsu actually died 700 years ago and was brought back to life by his brother Zareph, who made him a demon. And because of the way Zareph brought him back to life, while Zareph is technically Natsu's brother, in this sense, he is Natsu's father, at least metaphorically, in the fact that he created this demon version of him. The same way that Igniel is Natsu's father in the way he raised him. So these two seeds inside of him are almost like the ways in which he is forced to grow up because of who his fathers are. But then what's extra interesting here is Igniel, his better father, is not wanting him to ever have to become the monster he would need to because of this way he was raised. And then Zeref on the other side is like, no, I want you to become that. I raised you to become this. So it becomes this idea of two dads, one saying, I raised you to be a specific way, and the other one saying, I want you to be your own person. And you don't have to look any further than the fact that one in the show is a good guy, one in the show is a bad guy, to say, which is the right answer to all this? I'm neither of them. Because I'm human. I'm Natsu Dragneel! I'm impressed, Natsu. You found the right answer. Let's talk about fairy tale and specifically how the final two bad guys fit into the most major theme of the series. Above anything else, love is the most important theme in fairy tale. This is a big chunk of why there is so much shit bait throughout the entire series. This is why half of the series finale is spent just saying who ended up in relationships or might be in relationships. This is why the power of friendship is such a major part of the show. The power of love. The essence of magic. But part of how you demonstrate a theme in something like this is how the villains fit in with it. So let's look at Zareph and Acnologia. Zareph's an interesting antithesis to this because his evil doesn't come from a lack of love. In fact, it's the fact that he loved so much that he was cursed and now his love has become destructive. So he's very literally, what if we completely flip the idea of love as the most powerful force and make it the most terrifying force. But how he's responded to this is to become completely apathetic. The best thing he could do, the kindest thing he could do, is not to care at all. In this show about love, he is a villain who can't feel love because it will hurt the people he loves. But in the end, it's both being loved and loving himself that finally brings him peace. And then there's Acnologia, the very final bad guy, who is so driven by hate that he doesn't know who he is anymore. My name has faded from my memory, but the name of that wretched beast will stay with me forever. And of course, hate being the complete opposite of love, this is perfect symmetry in here, where you take on the guy who doesn't exist in any other sense than his hatred of dragons. There's the scene where he gets the name Acnologia, because that was the dragon he hated most, and he's forgotten anything about his own identity because he's so fueled by this hunt for revenge. He's defeated not by one dragon slayer, but by seven, because again, the power of friendship, baby. Hatred can't beat love. So, what's better for a show so strongly about love than final villains that are representative of apathy and hate? I've been doing a rewatch of Fairy Tale for the first time since the final season originally aired, and I'm absolutely loving returning to this world. This is probably my all time favorite anime. And one thing that has to be said about it is it is pretty much consisting of two things it is either action scenes with some pretty hype music behind it, see my other TikTok for more on that, or it's shit bait. That's it. It is these two things. 
There's the power of friendship stuff, but that even comes out of the fact that they are blurring the lines between what is platonic and romantic love because it is just nothing but ship bait. And because of this, it is probably the show that I care most about the possible shipping. Outside of maybe this one ship from My Hero Academia. So, I wanted to talk about my favorite ships from Fairy Tale. Starting off, especially because I already brought up my favorite ship from My Hero Academia, I gotta give it to Freed and Loxus. Now, this is probably one of the least likely things to ever get made canon, but Freed deserves it. But if we want to talk real canon ships, you gotta give it to Biska and Alzac. Oh my god, these two are adorable together. I love the two little gunslingers and their little baby! Ah! Next, maybe a little controversial. Grey and Juvia and Leon. I don't see this as both of them being with Juvia. I see it as Leon and Grey clearly love each other. Leon loves Grey. Leon loves Juvia. Juvia loves Grey. She has maybe mixed feelings about Leon. Grey is too cool to say feelings about anyone, but you know he loves them both. Back to Kier Cannon, Levy and Gajil. Ah! These two are adorable. I hate the way this starts, but everything after that is amazing. Urza and Jalal, again, just like Gajil and Levy. It's like, ah, the beginnings of this are not good, but everything after that, after Jalal finds redemption, or at least is trying to find redemption, and Urza can't help but feel the things she did as a kid, and ah. And I'm real basic, so let's be real. My number one ship is Natsu and Lucy. I absolutely love these two, the princess and the dragon, as every fairy tale should go. It's all just great. I love this show. 